Hi, this is Anna Hack from Green Talk, and today we have a special guest on the show. We have Allison Evanaugh. Did I do that right, Allison? You did. You did. <laughs> Me and last names. She is the CEO of Square One, and we're going to be talking about organic vodka today. I mean, I've talked about Allison, oh, back 2007. It was a great interview, and I was so impressed with you, Allison. I, I, you can't imagine, you know, what have you done with Square One? But fast forward six years, a lot has changed since we've talked. I was on your website just, you know, a week ago, and I said, wow, where was I? So a lot of people don't know <laughs> Square One. Um, I know it because I actually used it in my bar mitzvahs because of you. And everybody raved about it. Thank and I you. said, well, you know, I pick them good. So let's talk about what is what makes Square One so different than all the other vodkas out there. I know it's a laundry list, but I'm going to give you the floor for you to talk about distillation okay. methods and all the special things about square one okay great um, well yeah I mean everybody wants their own products to be different and um, we we tried certainly to make them unique and, and different and appealing to as many people as possible uh, I, I would say the main the main differences if you will from a strictly a product point of view is that uh, we're American made and we're made from hundred percent organic rye uh, it's not very common anymore for vodkas to use rye as a base grain, whether they be organic or not. Um, it's a little more known in Eastern Europe to use rye as a base, but in America, a, a lot of vodkas made in the U.S. are made from corn or wheat, maybe a little bit of potato. So just from the very beginning, um, rye as a base, uh, and organic rye is really one of the points of differentiation. And the reason I chose rye is I like the flavor of rye. I mean, if you think of the difference between Wheat bread, let's say, and rye bread, rye is nuttier, it's heavier, it's got a little more character and flavor than wheat. And so that translates into the base spirit even after distillation. So that was one of the reasons, of course, to choose rye was just the flavor profile. Um, the, the other thing, of course, is the organicness. Um, so really the genesis of the company was I saw a lot of bartenders in the Bay Area where we live, San Francisco Bay Area, using farmer's market ingredients in their cocktails, kind of, uh, you know, highlighting the fact that they were sourcing locally and, and using organic ingredients, but then they were using spirits that were not only not organic, but in a lot of cases, unfortunately, there's still a, a very large number of spirits on the market, um, vodkas or otherwise, that are using using additives like glycerin and citric acid and fake flavors and synthetic lab created flavors and the idea was really I wanted to provide the bartending community a line of all natural all certified organic um, spirits that work in that style of cocktail so that would probably be you know one of the biggest differences for us is it's the philosophy of organic and wanting people to drink something that tastes real because it is real. Yeah, that was actually one of the comments that a lot of the people at my bar mitzvah said is that how clean it tasted. And so that you can know that, that right. you know, you don't get a hangover with your, your vodka. Seriously, I kind of know from personal experience. But, you know, I know you're laughing, <laughs> but, you know, you, you got to gotta test these things. I do a lot for my audience. But, you know, the one thing is that really struck me about your product was the level of detail that you've taken with this product, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't just the organic mm -hmm. rice, where it's being grown, and the distillation. Talk about the distillation. Yeah, the distillation, uh, you know, a lot of other brands in our space, our, our category, will talk more about how many times distilled their product is, and that's really where their emphasis and focus is on the, the ultimate quality uh, at the end. And for us, it's actually not a, as much about distillation. Our primary focus is on fermentation. So the way the, way the process works is the, we, we literally source the, the organic rye from a group of farmers in Montana. We place the order as needed, so it's not like we're sitting on silos of our own product. Uh, so we will we will get in touch with them and place an order for rye. We will mill it at a mill in Montana uh, on its way to the distillery in Idaho. So when it gets to the distillery, it is actually in the form of rye flour. Um, so we get it in, and, and fermentation is basically adding, you know, water, yeast, and other enzymatic types of catalysts and things like that, and literally cooking it into low-proof alcohol, in essence, wine or beer. It's literally almost the alcohol proof of wine or beer. 
And for us, fermentation is really important because by being certified organic, the whole product, not just using organic rye as a base, but actually the whole process being certified organic, it dictates certain ingredients that we can or cannot use in fermentation, um, particularly yeast, which these days there's a lot of genetically modified yeast. And needless to say, ours cannot be genetically modified. We have to use natural wild yeast and other types of processing aids that help in the fermentation. So ultimately, what we get out of the fermentation is a really, really high quality product that has been kind of very naturally processed, has not been over extracted. So when we go into distillation, we're starting with a really great product, a really clean product. And we don't need to over distill to strip out, quote unquote, bad flavors. So our distillation is just a one-time uh, distillation through a four-column still, and we don't even filter through charcoal. We filter through a paper micron filter, which is a glorified coffee filter, if you will. It's literally just this giant thin piece of, of, of micron paper that catches any possible last-minute solids or things that got through, snuck through the distillation process. So... For us, really, the emphasis in quality and the ultimate flavor profile comes at the beginning in fermentation, not with how much we strip out bad flavors. But you know, it's amazing to talk about fermentation and distillation because I, too, was under the impression when you, know, you go walk in the liquor store, you see been distilled eight times. You're thinking, wow, this has got to be a premium product. And, they, of course, they've got a premium price to go with it. When, when you talk about that, is that... How does that factor in with your cost? Does it make it less expensive because you're spending it up front and not having to go through the distillation process, or is it kind of equal out? It pretty much equals out. I mean, obviously, if you literally are physically redistilling and redistilling in order to get the clean product that you're looking for, then you're using more energy. Uh, and quite frankly, spirits production is one of the most energy uh, intensive uh, processes, industrial processes, you know, in the market as far as consumer goods are concerned. So it, it's not exactly green in that sense. Um, I wouldn't argue that somebody by distilling eight times is, is less green necessarily, but it just means that they are using more energy if they have to pass it through the still so many times. But a lot of it really depends on the type of still you have, um, what your what your volume options are. I mean, some some micro really micro distillers, their stills are literally physically so small that they really have no choice but to run it through the still a couple times in order to get it the way they need to get it. So, it, it's kind of not really an apples to apples comparison. It, it just depends on the equipment that you have and, and how you go about I it. I can't imagine how you jump through all these hoops because it's you, you know you, all the things that if you look on your page, it's, and even I wrote about it. It was like a laundry list. Of all these things yeah. that you had to think about, how in the world did you figure this out? You know, sometimes I ask myself that same question. You, you, you know, I have the benefit of now looking back seven years and going, what the heck was I thinking? And, if, and the statement of ignorance is bliss is definitely true. It's, it's one of those, it's a good thing I didn't know then what I know now, or I don't know if I would have had the gumption to do it. But... Um, it's literally just about knowing what you want. At the end of the day, it's, you know, it sounds very cliche, but if you know what you want and you have personal belief and passion in what you want on the back end, you just go through the steps to get there. And I think the beauty of being small is that we don't have to compromise. Um, you know, we're not a big global brand, uh, although we do sell internationally, but we're not one of these big, huge global brands that has to look at, you know, the bottom line or if we don't sell X many cases out uh, in the first year, we're considered a failure. And so the beauty for us is we don't have to compromise. And so I literally, with my distiller, went through the list of all the things that were just not I was not willing to compromise on. I was not willing to change on what it had to be and whether it was the packaging or the ingredients or the botanicals we use and that every single botanical had to be certified organic and that could, we could only use the real botanicals in there. We couldn't kind of fake the flavor by saying, well, we want this flavor to taste more like that, so let's add a flavor and not mention it. You know, it, it's all what you see is what you get. And so I think just going through the whole process 
with knowing what we wanted at the end and, and knowing that integrity was such an important part of who we are, it actually wasn't that difficult. I think it's harder when you have to make compromises in a way. Because, you know, you, so, I can't you talk about that because I was just at a seminar about bringing food to market, to retail, and it was a lot about mm -hmm. compromising because of cost. Things that you really wanted to do made it yeah. so cost prohibitive that people can't, they price themselves out of the market. But in your case, how were mm -hmm. you able to take all of that, all the things that you wanted, and still be competitive? That you had a market that says, yeah, I'm going to pay for that. It's the million dollar. Yeah. Well, I it's a million dollar question. I, it's, yeah, it is. And, and the irony is I have to be perfectly honest and say it's, it's been a struggle. I mean, I, the reality is, is that we have created a successful product, but our margins are nowhere near what everybody else's are at our same price point. So, you know, we, we depending on where you live, our, our retail price points tend to be between 30 and $35. And to be honest, to make the kind of margins that some of my competitors, uh, you know, primarily large brands that are not necessarily organic, uh, we probably would have to be 50 plus dollars on shelf. And obviously, then we wouldn't sell anything. So we, um, one of the compromises was was to my own margins. Um, but at the end of the day, I really kind of felt that from the consumer perspective, and I do look at it at, from a consumer perspective because a lot of these brands I created as if I were a consumer because I am the consumer. And so for me, I wanted to bring products to market that were unique and different and the real deal. And um, and, and, and make them in such a, such a way that people said, wow, you know, I am going to pay maybe $8, $10 more per bottle for this product than another. But at the end of the day, it tastes better. I feel better. It makes a better cocktail. It gives me more versatility. It, you know, there's so many trade-offs in the positive for us not compromising. And, and, and I think the other thing, too, is that in general, I think American society, particularly those who are into food and drink, you know, we, we're waking up. We are realizing that the real deal matters, that and, and it needs to be the real thing. It needs to be authentic. It needs to be organic. It needs to be non-GMO. And we are looking for and going out of our way to source and support those products that do that. And I think we kind of hit the market at the right time. I, I think that's part of part of the success as well as timing. Right, because one of the things, too, I was going to ask you, because I read in um, one of the articles that a lot of the, the reason the product, you were making the product, is that you saw that bartenders would really gravitate towards this clean, fresh, you know, a product. And another CEO yeah. that I interviewed, um, he also talked about as well, he actually went the chef route to introduce his product mm -hmm. before he really pushed it out into mm -hmm. the retail market. Was that your strategy from the beginning or it was kind of like, you know, I'm going to hit both ends? What was your strategy in getting your product out and accepted? It really was all about the bartenders at the beginning. And and if you think about it, really our philosophy from the from from day one, and I love the fact that that hasn't changed, not only because we didn't want it to change, but because we we read the market correctly, and so we didn't have to adapt or let's say compromise again to to fit the market, which is our philosophy is we want to bring the culinary organic kitchen to the bar. So if you think about the approach that a lot of chefs have taken in their cuisine, this farmer's market approach, there may be even naming some of the sourcing of their ingredients on the menu. They're sourcing more locally. They're sourcing sustainable or organically made products. And in that philosophy, we really wanted to imbue into the cocktail culture as well. And fortunately, there was already a, a small, but there was already a base of the bartending community that had started to adapt that chef-like approach to their cocktail programs. So those were the people we went after first. So instead of saying, oh, let's let's start getting distribution in XYZ state because it's a big state, what we would do is say, well, are there, an, are there enough believers in the cocktail community, meaning the bartending community, to, to, to embrace and know what we do? So when we first started, we were only in New York City and San Francisco. And that's, you know, San Francisco is easy because it's my backyard, but it also happens to be, 
you know, Marin County where I live and San Francisco is one of the greenest, you know, most progressive uh, markets in the country and New York, of course, being a very food centric, cocktail centric market. We started in cities like that and we went straight to the bartenders and we got the bartenders to embrace the philosophy more than oh, hi, Mr. Distributor, I have a new product, will you carry it? So it was basically backdooring the distribution and getting the bartending community on board. And to this day, that's still very much our emphasis. I mean, we obviously are, are, are much more consumer uh, centric, meaning we're, we're big enough now in the world of, of small brands to talk directly to consumers and, and they kind of get what we do. We're not such an anomaly anymore with our weird botanical garden-like flavors and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, the bartending community has been the ticket for us and, and they're the ones that are helping us spread the word. But you know that every, every market's different and I'd be remiss not to ask you about this, but you're, tell us a little bit about your background because it's not like you went from you know, um, doing something totally different into figuring out why bartenders were really your, your first demographic. So tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. Well, I, on a personal level, I mean, and you can probably tell I'm a foodie. I'm a, you know, I love wine. I love cocktails. I love food. I go to restaurants. I, I, you know, I kind of live and breathe that whole you know, very food beverage centric uh, lifestyle. It's just, you know, I love to entertain and socialize. So, so having a personal base in that is great. But the beauty of, of what I did before is that it's helped my business today and that I've been in the wine and spirits and previously food business before. So I've been in consumer products, if you will, for quite some time in the last 15 plus years in wine and spirits. And so I kind of cut my teeth, if you will, with the big boys in the industry, a lot of, of large companies that trained me well. Um, and, and I learned a lot by working in large companies with big budgets, um, even though that has nothing to do with my real world today. But the, the good thing is, is I knew the industry. I, I knew the distribution system. I knew how the margins worked. I knew how the route to market worked. I knew product development. I, I, you know, I had enough experience in the overall industry that it wasn't that odd for me to get into it. I, I will say that this particular industry, because of the laws and the legal constraints, is probably one of the most difficult ones to crack if you're not from it, if you don't already have the experience. And, and there are a lot of great products that have come to market from entrepreneurs from outside of the market that haven't really made it through after a couple years. And I think ultimately it's because of the structure of the market and, and the way we have to do business with, with all of the laws. And, and I'm glad that I, I had that background to fall back on and the contacts and the people that I already knew. Because then, again, I could rely more on making the product that I wanted to make because I knew how to get it through the system, which is the most difficult part. Right, because that's what I read on some of the articles of your interviews is that how difficult all the different distribution, like going to Canada and then going to Europe and, and having to figure, yeah. you know, almost like, it's almost like waiting in murky water. You know? So I can't yeah. imagine anybody who doesn't have your background from the get-go be able to do it, what you did. I mean, it had to be... Well, it can be done, but it's just a lot easier. The learning curve, instead of being inverted, is maybe only this way, you know. So uh, I, I had a learning curve. There were a lot of things that I thought I knew that I didn't know when I got into it. And I thought, wow, you know, it's very different doing it by yourself versus having a whole huge corporation behind you. But but at least I, I you know, uh, I knew what to do. Sometimes you just had to figure it out. Where there, if you come from outside the industry, a lot of times you actually don't even know what to do. So I did have that. So benefit. what would what would you say like your top three things were that really were big learning curves for you? Um, I would say probably, oh gosh, you know, it's money. At the end of the day, it's all about money, right? I mean. It always takes more money than you think. It always takes longer to get where you want to go than you think. Uh, so, it, you know, people can love your product and say, oh, this is great and I'm going to buy it. I'm going to tell my friends and, and you know they will and they do. But it doesn't mean it's going to turn into an overnight success. That every single day is a bottle by bottle sale. And every single day is a, oh, my God, I better look at my P&L kind of day. Um, you know, am I going to run out of money? Do, where do I get more money? I'm growing or I'm not growing or I'm investing. And, and I think that's always been the biggest um, struggle. But for me, it's 
probably been the piece that I've enjoyed the most because it expanded my personal, you know, my personal horizons from a, as a professional because I really had to learn how to run a whole business and not just be a vice president of marketing, for example, in a big company. And so that, that was probably the big aha was the, oh, my God, I actually have to run this thing all day, every day, and pay attention to all of the numbers. Right, now I think that the hardest part would have been your distrib is sourcing distribution. Is, were those the two hardest part of your business, your business model? Yes and no. Um, you know, technically, yes, and it still is. I mean, and driving, driving the product through the distribution channel is the most difficult because it's the most efficient, dis I mean, inefficient. Um, so if you think that you, as a consumer, want to buy my product, before I can get my product to you, by law, I have to produce it and then sell it to a wholesaler in your state who has to turn around and sell it to a retailer in your city and then you go buy it and so I have to make sure that I get somebody on the front end to be willing to carry my product in your state then they have to have a relationship with that retailer who's willing to carry the product I mean it just takes a long time to get the product to market I you can't go onto my website and say hi square one I heard about you and I want to try it can I buy a bottle not for me you can't I can direct you to retailers but you can't so yes it 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 is and will continue to always be a struggle. Distribution is everything in this industry. Having said that, going back to what I said a little a few minutes ago, timing is everything. We launched April 1st, 2006. And in April, I don't know if you remember, but the April issue of Vanity Fair was the first time ever that a major magazine printed an issue dedicated yes. to everything. Yes, I do great. remember that. And I, I used that as an example, along with many other examples, of how the world was going green much faster, and it was going mainstream. That green was no longer just the kind of uh, outer periphery um, or perceived stereotypical hippy-dippy uh, type of person, that, that people were being very conscious about what they were buying, they wanted to buy products that were well-made, that were not harming the environment. It didn't mean that they were necessarily uh, the, the type of consumer that was going to go out and become a huge activist, but that they wanted, they wanted to consciously buy better products. And, and I said, you know, it, it can translate to spirits. And so the reality is, is because of the timing, us being the first all organic spirits company created in the US. There were some organic brands individually or imported that existed before us, but as far as a, a US based company that put their stake in the ground and said everything we do is going to be certified organic or we're not going to do it, to my knowledge we were the first company because this was back in 2004 when we you know first established the company even though we didn't come out with the product until 2006. And so by the time we did come to market it, it, it was definitely a trend. And so when I called on distributors, and at the time I only had one product, I only had the straight organic rye vodka. I didn't have some of these really cool botanical-based spirits that we have now. And, and so here I only have one product. But because of the, the movement of green and organic and the importance of that and American-made and things like that, the timing was so good that a lot of really good distributors gave me a shot. And, and I told them, you bring my product in, put a couple cases on the floor, and I will find a way to sell it. I will find a way, even from California, to get New York restaurants and retailers to buy it. Because there is a demand for organic out there. And we're first going to go after the organic people who know it, understand it, and believe in it. And then we'll go out into the main market later. And that's how we've grown is now we're not just in all the organic kind of restaurants. We're in great cocktail bars that may or may not have a complete organic philosophy but recognize the quality of our product and want to put it on their cocktail menu or the same thing at retail. So let's talk about marketing because how do you stay competitive? I mean, there's a couple things. You know, at the beginning, you were like the only one, and then now you have competition. Right. So how do you stay competitive? Yes. I mean, I see when I walk into a liquor store, I see that there are other you know, organic, whatever that is, vodkas out there or whatever. So right. is that why you ended up increasing your product line or is that because something that you always wanted to do? Well, I definitely always wanted to do the product line. And, and, and if, you, if you look through the line after the straight vodka 
Uh, we have the cucumber, all of them, of course, certified organic. We have the cucumber vodka. We have the botanical, which is the best way to describe it is kind of in the world of gins or aquavies, meaning there are multiple botanicals in them, but with different styles. Uh, so it's not a gin, it's not an aquavie, it's got flowers and herbs and things. And then the one we came out with about almost two years ago is, is our basil, which is four different types of basil, lemongrass, coriander, honeysuckle flower. So again, a very herbal, flowery type of very pretty profile. The idea behind that line was really to, to, to come from the garden approach. If, if you think about the world of, of flavored white spirits, you either have fruit flavored vodkas primarily or gin. Uh, you have a few kind of you know herbal or vegetable ones in between a few pepper vodkas or things like that but you really didn't have this more middle approach to using garden-like varietals. You either had gins with roots and barks and things you've never heard of and and very strong juniper which I personally love but not everybody does or you had fruit vodkas and I thought well what if what if we look to the garden and we look to herbs and flowers and spices and things like that to to make our spirits because ultimately they play really, really well in this kind of culinary style cocktail, which means they're they're drier, they're they're not as sweet, they're not as overpowering. They go with food. You can actually enjoy a cocktail with food without feeling like, oh, it's cloying. Um, so that was the overall approach um, from the beginning. And I would say that that's been probably the big competitive edge for, for a couple reasons. One, because we were first to market with everything, meaning first organic spirits company, first cucumber vodka, there are multiples now, organic or otherwise, first kind of no gin gin, if you will, with this botanical that is almost gin-like but with no juniper, um, and the first basil. And so part of it is being, you know, truly innovative, not just coming out with an organic version of lemon vodka. Um, but I would say the other piece, too, is really staying true to who we are. Um, and doing everything with that level of integrity. I mean, the packaging, as you know, um, you know, we've made some great, great strides in trying to green our packaging. There are a gazillion things we could do better and, and improve upon. But things like, you know, when we first started, we started with a paper linen label because that's really all there was. And now we have a label that's made from bamboo, sugarcane, pulp, and cotton. Um, we purposely made our bottles so that you can wash them off, which is why, you know, Chief Bottle Washer was in my title in the beginning, and reuse the bottles. And there's a restaurant in, in, in Berkeley uh, called Gather that actually uses our naked bottles as their bar lights hanging from their bar. So all, this whole philosophy um, that we bring to the business side, not just the, the, the flavor profile or the consumer side, I feel gives, gives us a lot of support from our partners. Our distributors believe in us. Our distributors support our products. The, the bartending community and the retailers who know our story, they know we're the real deal. We're not just some guy, gal, whatever company who decided one day, oh, I want to go out and, you know, try to b build a brand and make a quick buck. That's not what we do. And so it, it, that story carries through a lot deeper than I think people so know. So it sounds like real authenticity. Yeah, it is because it's personal. I mean, it, my my face is on it. So, I, it's, you know, if I hid behind the curtain, I could probably do whatever I wanted and it didn't matter. But, you know, my face is on it for a reason. It's it's about just doing it for the, you know, the right reasons and trying to do it well. And, and so, yeah, it is about authenticity and quote unquote truth in advertising. We're not going to we're not going to tell you that we. Uh, you know, that our, our vodka is the world's best tasting vodka because we distill it a hundred times just because we said so. You know, that's not what But we how, do. you know, with the economy happening, taking like it did, how are you able to, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're probably going, yeah, I know. Uh, how, how are you able to, I'm just watching your face, you know, how are you able to yeah. still maintain, you know, your presence? And you, you were expanding too. So how did, so yeah. how, yeah. tell me about that. Yeah. It was fascinating uh, now that I have the hindsight uh, as perspective right um, ironically right as the economy was tanking I was at a women business conference um, I was very fortunate to win an award back in 2006 called make mine a million um, and it's it's part of this nonprofit uh, organization called count me in for women's economic independence and um, one of their core sponsors uh, American Express and this company were having this huge 
you know, women's conference in Miami, um, and I had already been a winner a couple years before, and, and the founder of Count Me and asked me to come and, and be part of it to kind of bring other women into the, into the business community, and she gave a kind of keynote, if you will, to everybody, and it's December 2008, the market is in the tank, everybody's freaking out, and, and I'm freaking out, and, and one of the things she said was, you know, the one thing you have to think about as a business owner is that, you know, this economy, it, it's not going to turn around right away. It is, we're, this is going to be big, and it's going to be hard, and it's going to be long. And so you as a business owner have to really, really, really look hard at your business and try to find the silver lining. And those were her words. Find the silver lining in your business. Do what you need to do to survive. You've got to get to the other end and find the silver lining. So a couple things we did was I did have to cut back. I, I did have to let a salesperson go, which was unfortunate. Um, and it's literally because I wasn't going to hit payroll. Um, we were still in investment mode, and so I, we were still losing money, and I was still using personal funds to fuel the business. And those funds kind of had evaporated along with the rest of the stock market. Um, and so I did have to make some really hard cuts, and we did have to cut back on marketing spend and things like that. But interestingly enough, one of the silver linings that came out of it was we were right in the middle of talking to packaging companies about changing our sourcing because my pricing had gotten too high and my margins were getting really bad. And because the, ma the market was so bad, overnight I had four to five companies in the glass space who never would have talked to me before because I was too small, all of a sudden bidding for my business. And so the next thing you know, I'm getting it. I'm getting these four or five major packaging companies bidding on my little piece of chunk of business and bidding very competitively. And so I ultimately was able to change my sourcing and save 30 to 40 percent on my packaging costs. So it's things like that. I think when you go through the bad times and you really have no choice but to look and find the ways to get through to the other side, that you do find the silver lining. And and so from a Running the company point of view, you know, we, we, we managed it well. From a, from a business expansion point of view, yeah, 2009 was, was, was brutal. I mean, we were flat. Everybody said if you were flat in 2009, you were, you were on fire, right? Um, and so 2009 was a flat year, but then we came roaring back in 10, 2010, and then 2011 was a breakout year for us. And then 2012, we, last year we had a great year, and so the reality is, is that the, the business is going well, and I think it's because uh, America and other countries that we're in, they, they love the products we make, they recognize the quality, and the palate of, of the cocktail consumer is changing, and they're changing towards where we're leading them. You know, we're the ones leading the charge with a slightly more savory, drier, more, more uh, sophisticated, if you will, cocktail experience, and they're starting to follow. So it's a combination of good business practices and, and being ahead of the curve as far as leading the, the, the consumer where, where we know they want to go. So how do you market to the consumer when they walk in the store and they see all these different vodkas and they say, well, I'm not going to pay an extra $10, $15 for that vodka. Right. Well, how do you get people to realize, yeah, you want to because quality means something? Yeah. You know, to be honest, if they walk in cold to a, a retail environment, they've never heard of our brand, they don't have any, they've never had any, inter, any interaction either with us directly or, let's say, having tried the product on a cocktail menu, then it's, it's a pretty tough proposition. I mean, we're lucky if maybe some of our retailers will put a shelf talker up that maybe has a recipe or will quote a a, you know, a 94 point rating or something and they're buying on ratings because they don't really know what to buy on. I mean, that does still happen. But the reality is, is what we've seen and heard anecdotally, at least, is that primarily the consumer engages with our brand first at the bar. And not surprisingly, because that's our strategy. Our strategy is we want the bartenders and the restaurants to put our, our spirits on their cocktail menus and allow the consumer to taste them first in the bar environment and with a well-made cocktail. And so I would say largely most of our retail sales come from somebody who's experienced it thanks to one of our relationships with, with a, a bar, restaurant, hotel, or whatever. Um, but, but we also do a fair number of events. I mean, we have been extremely supportive 
especially of the green community and of the culinary and cocktail community in our event support. So we don't we don't go out and do willy-nilly events. We will support events, um, you know, like uh, uh, Rainforest Action Network, you know, we've done events with. We've done uh, events with all kinds of green organizations and, you know, they're doing their fundraisers and we're providing them with product and cocktail services to to have their, their you know, their, their benefactor or their, I guess, their client target for, for fundraising to be there to enjoy themselves. And so we will support those types of events, and that allows the consumer to try the product in an intimate environment, engage with us directly, and then hopefully go out and, and be willing to buy it at retail. So it's a very hands-on, bottle-by-bottle approach. We don't have any print advertising, no radio, no anything. It's all hand-selling, grassroots marketing. But you know, the one thing that I, I found really interesting in this this uh, seminar that I went to is they talked about packaging and they talked about what your bottle looks like and how to distinguish yourself on the on the shelf from everybody else. And your bottle is extremely distinctive. You, do you by chance yes. have one by you? I see it, I see it um, in the background. Yeah. I want people to see this bottle. I, sh I should have said something before the interview to have this bottle ready. That's okay. So this is this is the uh, the straight vodka. Let me get out of the way and put it over here so you can see it with no background. But see, that's, but that's the it's cool the, thing about its whole. It's it's got a beautiful presentation, and it was so funny to listen. You know, I always think you know product, 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 and they said no presentation, 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 and it was almost like they had done studies and presentation. A lot of times wins the game. It, it, it does. And, you know, I, I, you know, I think the camera. that's... Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. And the reason I got out of the camera is there's a little thing on here, but I'll also show you because it's easier to see. This is our little mini How bottle. Cute. Which is... I know. So it's a replica 50 ml. And we have, for example, we're in some of the mini bars in some of the hotels across the country. And you can buy these at retail as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, presentation is everything. And... and I, Sometimes it's hard when you, you know, you're trying to be in a, a sustainable company and eco-minded and some of the things you do and, and, and trying to balance the two. And for example, I knew packaging, especially in the vodka category, where it is, you know, there are a lot of people who just jump in to the category because it's easy to make a vodka, meaning that you don't have to age it for 10 years before it comes out like, like brown spirits. Um, and so one of the challenges is standing out on shelf. And I knew early on that packaging was going to be very critical. And, and, and in the very beginning, before we had a product, uh, and we were talking to a bunch of consumers and industry people, a lot of industry people said, oh, don't spend your money on, on, on getting a custom bottle. Just do a really great packaging design on a stock bottle. And, you know, I, I really thought that's not going to fly. It, it's really not going to work to stand out on shelf. But also, then, then the reality is, is if a consumer buys a traditional bottle off the shelf, then they're just going to throw it away like every other bottle. And what if we create a bottle that not only stands out on shelf, but is beautiful enough when you take the labels off that you may consider using it for another purpose before you recycle it? And so when you think about it, um, our bottle can be used as an olive oil bottle, a water bottle, a vase, or as I mentioned earlier, there's a restaurant in Berkeley that actually strung lights through it and hung it from their from their bar. And so, yes, presentation is everything. And so at, if a consumer is standing at the shelf and they don't know if price point is not as big of a deal, and, you know, we're not way overpriced compared to other products. We are a luxury price product, but we're, we're definitely competitive with, with brands of our, of our quality, then packaging does matter and and from a green perspective what's cool is we also have one of the smallest footprints of packaging in the marketplace because since we're square our our carton is one of the most efficient cartons um, in the industry because we don't have to make extra room for the round bottle. That's very cool I never even thought about it you're right one of my yeah. readers asked me this question and I have to ask it because you probably think, oh it's the woman question again but I have to ask it because you know you're a mom you have two boys how do, you, how do you do this? I mean, how, how do you balance? Because, you know, women are, women are different. You know, if our child's homesick, you still got to go into work. Your heart's yeah. tugging. Yeah. So how, how, do you, how do you pull it off? I have the most amazing husband on the planet. <laughs> he is, has been a believer from the literally the morning that I woke up and said, honey, honey, I have a great idea to start a business. And he was the one that said, do it. 
Um, and, and then the next thing out of my mouth was, well, but what about the kids and how are we going to manage or whatever? And he's like, you know, we've always been a two career household and we met in business school. So he kind of knew what he was getting into when he met me in business school. Um, uh, but the other thing from a practical perspective, uh, you know, we had to find a solution that really made sense for us as a family because I do travel and my husband has a fairly high powered career himself in high tech. Um, and so he's traveling some as well. And at the end of the day, our decision was to have um, these wonderful girls from Europe as au pairs. So we have a live-in au pair, um, and we've had nine from, from since the boys were born, practically. I have my, my twin boys will be nine next week. Um, and that's really made a difference because by virtue of having a, a third person there, um, it, it does take a village to raise kids if you're trying to ru run a company as well. And, and, and that's really been the ticket for me. That little secret for me is having a great husband and also having a wonderful um, kind of au pair situation. There's a lot of times, and a lot of times, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Actually, a lot of people talk about, and I was talking to someone the other day about CEOs that run businesses, and a lot of times the business comes first, you know, and that's got to be tough on a marriage. It's got to be tough on kids. How have you handled that? Well, you know, it's been a little bit, it, it's a trade-off for me. There, there are definitely times where the business has to come first if, you know, it, it just does, or you don't move the business forward. And if you really think about it, if I don't move the business forward, then my, my family's actually in more jeopardy. I mortgaged my house. Um, to fund this business. Uh, my sister, who is my primary investor, she mortgaged her house. We put personal funds in. We do not have outside uh, industrial, or what, what do you call it, institutional inv yeah. investors or angels or anything like that. Um, we have a few other friends and family, but very, very low, low percentages, but not what I would call angel investors. And, and so part of the choice is, well, if I don't do this now for the business and it hurts the business, then I hurt the family. But then on the other side of the coin, you have the true family things, the things that go on every day and that you need to, to manage. Um, the fact is, I still run my company from home. Um, we were fortunate enough to live in a house that, when we bought it way before I started this company, had a little second cottage in it that had been a rental unit. And for the first couple years, uh, Margie, my marketing director, and I, it was literally just the two of us because all of the salespeople we had were out in the field, um, we were working in my home office. And so I could see my, I had breakfast with my kids, I had lunch with That's my kids. Um, when they went to, when they got old enough to go to school, you know, they would come home and I'd take a little, you know, break with them and have fun with them. My au pairs would be down in the playroom or doing homework with them. And if they needed help, they came up and interrupted me. And quite frankly, you know, it's, not that different than going to the water cooler and having a chit chat for 15 minutes um, in, in a corporate office. So, uh, you know, by virtue of having it at home and now it's in a cottage, not physically in my home, but it's 100 feet from my home. And my kids come over and say, hey, mom, can we have a gumball? And I keep a gumball, you know, machine here for them to have a treat every now and then. So that keeps me close to the family. Um, even though I'm working long hours. So I think those proximity makes them feel like I'm here. And that, I feel, is a really big part Yeah, that of it. absolutely would make a big difference. That's, it's so funny when I talk to you, you just, you're like a strategist. You kind of figure out how to make it work. You know, if, if you could yeah. look back, I'm going to do a look back mm -hmm. and a go forward. If you could look back and you had to identify, like, let's say one or two things that you wish you had done differently, what do you think you mm -hmm. would have done differently? for all those entrepreneurs out there that want to live the same dream? I would spend less money. <laughs> I, I think you, I think, and then maybe part of it was because I came from a big budget environment. That was my training working for big companies. And uh, you can do a lot more just going out and selling your product, you know, and really being truthful to it. And, and there were some things that I feel early on, you know, we kind of felt like we had to, you know, we had to get the buzz out there and we had to do that. And, and, and it was still all real. It was all real and authentic. But I feel like sometimes I could have been a little bit more, um, a little bit more, not, I don't want to say prudent, but a, a little bit more, less afraid to, to, to not, you know, spend money. So I, I do feel like we could have 
not struggled quite as hard in the first couple years by being a little tighter with the purse strings. Um, and I do feel like you get so excited as an entrepreneur and a great marketing idea comes up and you want to you wanna be seen and you're proud of doing this and you know you're getting the word out, which is great and it's helping, but the ROI isn't there. So I, I'm, I've become much more of a, of a, a, C, a CFO in my business um, than I have than I am a CMO now. Um, so that would be one thing that I would probably change is, is be a little tighter with the purse strings early on. And, uh, you know, going forward, what is it that you want to see the company look like in a couple years from now? What's your wish list? You know, I have so many other ideas for things that I want to do as far as the products um, that I know we can develop. And I'm, I feel like my ideas are still ahead of the market. And we've always been ahead of the market, which is great because that's how we're leading people to to drink this style of cocktail, which I feel is just tastes better and is more sophisticated and more enjoyable and, and really is more of a lifestyle cocktail, not a going out and, you know, having three drinks and, you know, partying, which is fine. There, you know, I guess there are people that's their thing. But for me, it's more of a sophisticated socializing experience that, that I want people to enjoy with our spirits. And um, so for me, what I really want is I want the bar kid to get there faster. I want, I, I want, I want the, the distribution system to understand that the consumer palate is there and wants and understands and, and is craving for our style of spirits and the kind of cocktails you can make with our spirits um, so that I can come out with some of these other really cool ideas I have. The, the challenge with our growth is that we are doing out-of-the-box products. We're, we're not just coming out with an organic version of things that already exist. We're creating new spirit flavor profiles and new ways to make cocktails with them. And so the education is huge. And so I, I just kind of wish it would go faster. I think if I could have that special hope, it would be hurry up market, catch up to what we're doing because I know you're going to love it. I have more stuff in the hopper, but I can't come out with it until you're kind of getting there. Um, so I just wish it would speed up a so little bit. So what would be your best advice? Like if someone was going to um, their liquor store and there's only so much shelf space, so right. and they don't see your bottle, so what should they do? Just to ask, to ask for them to get it? Absolutely. And, and it's not just ask. It's, it's basically demand, especially in this day and age where the economy is not so great and that retailer needs that, that customer to be happy. They need to not only say, this is what I'd like and I'd like you to special order it, but to demand it. Because unfortunately, I do feel like in, in, in still a fair, a sizable part of the market, the retail market in spirits is still so accustomed to the mass-produced brands that people walk in and just buy a bottle off the shelf because that's what they're used to buying. They're not exploring as much as they did in, they do in, say, craft beer or small, small production wines. It's starting to happen in spirits. And so I feel like the consumer has to go in and say, hey, I know about this really cool brand called Square One, and I really would like to to try some and I would really like to buy it from you because this is where I shop and so could you try to find it for me and bring it in and 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 I think that's important for them to not just let the retailer talk them out of it and say oh well I oh well, I have another organic product why don't you try this because they really should be demanding that they buy the things that they want um, not just asking so I think some retailers will not unfortunately be as customer focused as they should be because it's easy for them to just try to get the sale right then and there by turning them on to something now, else. Now, on your website, there's a, a place for people to go, right, to, to find out where they yes. can buy. So it's on, it's on online. It's in, do you have a list of where it's being sold? What's, what is, when they go online, what do they see? Yes. So, I mean, it's impossible for us to list every retailer, obviously. Um, so what you primarily will find is if you click on the where to buy, there are, by state, we've listed at least, you know, a fairly sizable list of those retailers who we know who consistently carry the product. We, we purposely try to find and, and recommend the ones that we know carry it on shelf, not just buy a bottle here, a bottle there. But then there's also an online list. And depending on where the person lives, 
um, you can either buy, in some states it's not legal to buy online from somewhere else, even within your state, but in certain states like New York, you can, you know, you can buy in New York City from a New York City, you know, retailer and they will ship to you. So there are certain different options to either physically go out and buy in brick and mortar or to, to buy online. So Allison, if you had one last thing that you wanted customers to hear about your company, what would that be? Um, I've, I've already touched on a little bit, but I think it, it would be really about trying to get them to understand maybe and embrace this idea of a more sophisticated culinary cocktail experience, if you will. And, and by, by that, what I mean is that if you think about the cocktails of 10 years ago or so, these sour apple martini, were, which were, they were all prefab flavors just poured into a cocktail shaker and, and that was, you know, that was it. Very sweet, very sugary, not very good quality spirits and did not let you feel good the next day. Um, the idea of a kind of culinary sophisticated cocktail is really more making your cocktail like you you make food. So using real ingredients and, and using kind of base recipes. Uh, it's a, almost a little bit like uh, some of my citrus-based cocktails I refer to as like you're making a mother sauce. Um, the proportions don't change. It's maybe sit a little bit, uh, you know, two ounces of spirits, half an ounce of citrus, lemon or lime, and a half an ounce of some sort of sweetener. My preference is, say, agave nectar. Um, so, for example, one of my favorite cocktails is simply a cucumber basil gimlet. We'll use two ounces of square one cucumber, a leaf or two of fresh basil or mint, if you like, um, a half an ounce of lime and a quarter ounce of agave nectar. Shake it all up in a shaker, and you have this amazing cocktail that tastes real because the real ingredients are in there. And so the idea of citrus and herbs and agave nectar instead of, you know, sugar bomb type of, of spirits, letting you sweeten the cocktail, I think provides a lot more sophisticated experience um, and a better better taste at the end. And, and for me, that's what I really hope. I hope the consumer taste profile will, will grow into um, to this kind of, of profile, both at home and, and in the restaurant. Is there any well. recipes on your website so they can go refer to that? Yes, we have a gazillion recipes on our website. Uh, if you go to squareoneorganicspirits.com and, and you navigate through some of the nav areas, there's a section called Mixology, and there are a slew of recipes. Some of them are as simple as the one I just mentioned, and then there are some others that are really wow cocktails that take a little while to create that might be more when you're doing, let's say, a signature cocktail for a special party at home that require a little bit more pre-prep. But you have from very, very easy three-ingredient cocktails all the way up to these 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 very, very um, out there type of recipes. But we have plenty to choose from. Allison, it was a pleasure, like always. And I'm, I hope that we talk in a couple years and you're going to wow me again with where your company's <laughs> going because I love to watch your growth. I mean, it's just amazing so it was great talking to you Allison again you know um, uh, listeners and readers uh, this video will be on Green Talk it'll be on YouTube it'll be on Blip TV and I encourage you to start asking questions about Allison's doing you know anything that you have that I didn't cover I will get back to you because I'll ask Allison directly and you know get your answers again Allison it was a pleasure thank you I really enjoyed it thanks for letting us tell our story